Hey, everybody. This is Joshua Literal. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Veterans for Cannabis podcast. It's going to be a really, really exciting day. We had a wonderful, wonderful Veterans Day. It's November, the month that veterans are honored. And I've got a wonderful guest. Her name is Tangi, and she's with Jane Green. Tangi, how are you doing today? I am excellent, Josh. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this. You know, I mean, this is what it's all about. It's about connecting, first and foremost, the movers and shakers in this in this industry. And really, it's about connecting the veteran community. So Tangi Daniel, she is CEO of Jane Green and chairwoman of and the board uh, chairwoman of the board for the Georgia Cannabis Coalition. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Oh, yes. So. Uh, Jane Green is a company that I started in California in 2014, and it's all about helping people with compliance, wellness, and profitability strategies. And so we do a lot of consulting. We do a lot of education. And so I built that brand over in L.A., but I'm actually from Atlanta. I'm from Georgia. And so once I found out that legalization was happening, um, I decided to come home and bring that education here. And myself and a couple other investors, we formed an organization, a collection of organizations called the Georgia Cannabis Coalition. And what that does is just bridge the gap between Georgia and the global market. And a lot of people don't recognize right now, but import and export is already taking place, and Georgia has some amazing advantages being uh, the world's busiest airport is here. There are a lot of Fortune 500 companies that are based right here in Georgia, and there's a lot of multimillionaires here as well. So we just decided to uh, come together and really just form a way for people to get involved in the industry here in Georgia. So it's been going very, very well. We've had some education events like the Georgia Cannabis Symposium, and then recently we had the Georgia Cannabis Investor Symposium. Beautiful. Well, I can tell you, I'm really excited about this podcast today with you because I think you and I, if I remember correctly, it's been five or six years since we met, and I believe it was at a woman, a Women Grow event. Is that correct? That sounds about right. It was a while ago, and I just remember meeting you, and we, like, it was instant love. It was just instant everything. It was awesome because, you know, vets recognize vets and we understand each other's language fluently. And so it was just great to meet you and and see what you were doing here in Georgia. So I've been watching your movement for a while with uh, the coalition and what you guys have going on. And I'm just so proud and so, you know, excited to partner up with you guys. Well, you know, you may have been watching me, but I've been watching you from afar too, because it's something that we look at, uh, first and foremost, you're a female in this industry, and that is that is something we need way more of. Let's let's just be real clear about that. And then Absolutely. you're a woman of color, too, and that – Wow, you're talking about needing more of those. We absolutely need more of those. And then, hey, just by the way, you happen to be a war fighter. You are a veteran and somebody that I am happy to lock arms and ar- arm in arm with, and I will pick up my AR all day long and, and go to war with you, you big bad Marine Corps. That's how I feel too, Josh. I really do. And I, I understand that like we take care of each other and we understand that this is this fight is bigger than all of us. And I think that's what we really admire um, the most about each other is like, this has absolutely nothing to do with Josh. This has absolutely nothing to do with Tangie. If we can save one veteran, literally one, from the knowledge that we have and from the access to quality medicine that we have, then that's the fight that we picked up after we left war. Yeah, that's so true. And you and I continue to fight that fight every single day. And it's it's a struggle sometimes here in the Southeast. And it's a struggle because we look at these Unfortunately, and I am part of my French, but these assholes who are not willing to listen to what we have to say, right? So we've been fighting for that for so long. Yesterday, Veterans Day, was the fourth year in a row we've done this casket demonstration. Tell us a little bit about that and how that went. So yesterday, I had the pleasure of going to the uh, Veterans Day event that you guys put on where you carried the casket full of pill bottles. And when I tell you, I was standing there in front of it, and I just remember crying. And, like, at first Mm -hmm. I was trying to hold back the tears, and they just got so overwhelmingly powerful that they just started streaming down my face because it's just super sad that veterans don't have access to the choice of natural alternatives. How dare we go fight overseas and in foreign countries and do what we're told, and then we don't even have the quality medicine that we need when we come back home. And so even if we, you know, took away 
a third of the pills, most of them give you suicidal thoughts, most of them, you know, have you depressed, most of them have you overweight or, you know, just a negative a negative impact on your life instead of making something positive. And we're already dealing with PTSD and chronic pain and insomnia, just things that we shouldn't be dealing with anyway, but those are the residuals of war. And so being at that event yesterday, number one, surrounded by other veterans, because, again, veterans speak veterans, and we understand how to talk to each other. We understand never to take anything personal. Everything is about love and patience and understanding. And so that's what I felt yesterday when I was at this event. When I tell you... um, it was palpable. It really was. The energy was insane at how strong and how, you know, how we really wanted to help, how we really, really want to see a difference made when it comes to the VA and their way of dealing with veterans. Tenji, honestly, think it's going to happen? You know what? I So when I left your event, Josh, oh, my goodness, I'm just the fact that you're asking me this. So I left your event, and I called my father, and he's an Air Force veteran. And so um, I just remember being on the phone crying with him and just like, this, I don't. I honestly don't for a couple of reasons. Because we were on the inside and we understand the bureaucracy of this and the games right. that are being played, I understand that we are the biggest consumers. Veterans are the biggest group of consumers when it comes to pharmaceutical medicine. <laughs> and if <laughs> yes, pharmaceutical companies have millions of dollars to put behind lobbyists and millions mm. of dollars to put in politicians' pockets, how are we supposed to compete with that? It's always going to be profits over patients. So if you it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like while we're even having this conversation, like if we're veterans and we say, okay, you asked us to go fight, we did that. And then we came home and now we're messed up. And we're telling you that the things that you're giving us aren't working. This particular thing that we know for a fact, this natural plant works for us. Why are we still having this conversation? Why are three bills completely stalled and stopped in Congress right now? Why is this happening? So I was on the phone with him like, Daddy, I don't see this happening unless, you know, unless we come up with our own set of dollars to put behind a politician. I don't, I don't, Josh, I don't. So I think you just answered it right there. And, and I agree with you. And I think if we can solve the dollar issue, because you know, just as well as I do, that most of our brothers and sisters, just like we, are not you know, uh, liquid in, in the millions of dollar amounts like the pharmaceutical companies, right? So yeah. we look at the Million Man March. We look at all the things that have happened in the past, how they got things done. I look at yesterday's event at, at the casket uh, demonstration, and I look at, you know, we had 7,500 people there. So we've got to continue to increase those numbers, and we can get it done. It may not be monetarily we're putting dollars into the pockets of the politicians, but doggone it, when we're knocking on their doors and there's a thousand of us in, in line, that's going to that's gonna bode really well for us. Absolutely. Like, it, it takes strength in numbers, especially if we don't have the capital. Then absolutely, we everybody has to count, and we have to show up in numbers and demand, absolutely force them to listen to us. Because at this point, and, and, uh, and what's even more sad about the situation, a lot of these politicians don't have a direct connection to war. They haven't served, or their children haven't served, or their family members. So they don't really understand the importance of getting it done right now. Like, we can't afford to wait another five years or another, Correct. you know, 15 years. Like, this needs to happen yesterday because we can't afford to keep losing the veterans that we're losing every single day. Well, it starts with us. You know, it starts with us becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable because if we get out from behind the TV, out from behind the computer screen, and out into the community, into the legislative body, into the capital in Atlanta, Tallahassee, Washington, D.C., wherever we're at, but if we're in their faces – just like you said, demanding that they make these changes, we can make it happen. But we got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So how can we help our brothers and sisters get off their asses and come out with us? That's a great question, Josh. And you know what? It's super unfortunate that that even had to happen because after coming home from two tours in Iraq myself, I have a lot of anxiety, a lot of, um, you know, triggers that come, especially going to the VA. The VA is a real big right. trigger for me. Um, and I get that a lot of veterans have seen so much that 
they do just want to just sit at home. They don't want to, you know, ruffle any other feathers or they don't want to be in crowds and they don't want to march and be a part of something that should automatically be given to us anyway. So I completely understand that point and I understand the need for, for them to get involved and say, look, you know, I did serve and, and I'm not asking you permission for this. I'm telling you this is the medicine that I want to you. This is the medicine I want to consume. And so um, it, it does take a lot of effort to let them know, number one, a lot of veterans don't even know that cannabis is a viable option. So finding the education and letting them know that this is you know, a choice, number one, that is federally legal, because a lot of veterans don't like breaking the law. They don't like to do illegal things, and if they think it's illegal for them, then they won't do that either. So letting them know that this is a legal, viable option that really works, letting them try it, letting them see that, you know, other people should have access to this just like they have access to it now, or they should have the right to consume this wherever they go and not just based on the state that they're in. I think it starts with education and then providing those products to them that actually work, that can actually help them, and then letting them uh, be the example that they want to see. So then they can go out there and, like, deal with the crowds. They can deal with the politicians. They can deal with all the ramifications that come with lobbying because that's stressful in itself. And I completely, it is. you know, it is so stressful to be at a Capitol every day in a suit begging someone to listen to you who doesn't. That's that's pretty stressful, isn't it, Josh? It is ex- extremely stressful. But you know what? The cannabis helps take that edge off. So exactly. if our brothers and sisters need access and they want to actually utilize cannabis, they want to try it, what – first and foremost, how can – you advise them to get uh, exposed to it? Do they start low, go slow? How do they, you know, determine what's good medicine versus not good medicine? How can you help our brothers and sisters understand how to how to get access to quality tested products? That's a great question. So I we always tell them number one, start low and go slow. If they're in a regulated market where they have access to THC, and a lot of people condemn THC, but it's very valuable. I know a lot of triple amputee veterans or mm-hmm. uh, you know amputee veterans who need THC for pain tolerance. I myself, I like uh, THC because my nightmares come in my sleep, and so I need THC to, to not dream and not think about the traumas of war. And so I think, you know, demystifying that and letting people understand that THC is okay. It's not, the whole plant is amazing for a reason. And so if they're in a regulated market, we tell them to make sure that they get educated, start low, go slow, make sure that they have third-party lab testing, make sure that they know what's in their medicine. It's so imperative because you could take something that's filled with pesticides or something that's counter to the reason you're taking it. And then you think that all cannabis is bad. And then that's just you know, a bad way to start off anyway. So making sure that it's quality tested, making sure that um, they know that smoking isn't the only option. A lot of them think yes. that they need to smoke, and that's that's the furthest thing from the truth. I use so many topicals, and I use a lot of pain patches, and I use tinctures that go underneath my tongue that gets into my bloodstream faster. I use bath bombs. I use massage oil. So there's so many options that they can utilize so you don't have to just stick to this one method. You can try them and see which one works best for you. So, Tangie, you mentioned the, uh, the, the patches. Tell me your experience with patches, because I'll tell you first and foremost, I, I'm, I'm a weird cat, right? Um, I, I can't stand edibles. I don't, I don't like those. I'm a vape guy. I like to vaporize or I like to, you know, just take one or two inhaled puffs and I'm good. I don't like to go too far, too fast or anything like that, but I've never had any good experiences with the pain patches, but do they work for you? They do. So the pain patches, what I love about those is I fly a lot. I travel a lot with the the Georgia Cannabis Coalition and with Jane Green. And so some of my flights are five plus hours and don't let me go overseas or somewhere. So I put the pain patch on right before I leave for the airport. And so it makes my flight so much better because I have chronic back pain. So it Mm -hmm. makes pain, um, you know, pain bearable during the long flights. And then it helps with recovery when I get off the plane and I'm getting where I'm going. So the patch is a way for it to enter your bloodstream without it being digested with your lung or your liver. And so it's just another method. And I think 
people should definitely try it. It depends on what, um, how many milligrams it is, and it just depends on the brand that you're consuming or using from last up to 24 to, to 96 hours. And so picking the right one is is tough to find sometimes. But once you do, I really, really